BC by aunts and uncles. By the time he was 19, he was part of the Chinese Canadian cafe landscape. He still is, by the way. <laughs> Having worked as a dishwasher, potato peeler, waiter, short order cook, and delivery boy in restaurants and greasy spoons throughout Chinese North America. Eventually, he put down roots in Vancouver's Chinatown, an experience that became central to much of his work. After four years at the Vancouver School of Art, he produced a body of photographs about Chinatown of that era. This is the one that just showed at uh, Center A. He has since worked as a community organizer, historian, radio broadcaster, and a founding member of the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop. I should also mention that uh, he was one of the co-editors of the seminal edited editions of Swallowing Clouds and Many Mount Birds. Jim, can you please give you Jim Wong shoes? I should mention this is one of the first poetry readings Jim has had in ages. He had one about two weeks ago, but he got drowned out by the karaoke party next door. <laughs> Thank you, Sid, and also thank you for the Art Festival, Art City Festival. I'm amazed for you guys all to come out on this wet and woolly day is absolutely fantastic. It shows the uh, how well the festival has progressed, and that uh, you know people are actually interested in things that we're talking about. So for that reason, I'm very, very grateful. Um, I also want to comment on the very first uh, film that uh, Karen did. Uh, there's a lot of swearing in uh, village dialect. <laughs> <laughs> but for people that didn't know, the Cantonese language is over 6,000 years old. It's actually one of the oldest languages in the world. And I kept imagining all these people swearing. You know, these people are building the Great Wall. And these people that were you know, getting buried as a terracotta soldiers. It just gave me this kind of really interesting idea that these guys were doing, saying the same things that we were saying now. <laughs> Anyways, I want to open with a, um, a poem about rain. Because, you know, it's the thing about Nankoo, you have to write about rain. <laughs> a curtain of rain, another act unfolds. Chinatown, forever changing. You and I, actors, audience, watching, being watched. Tender sweeties, nothing dampens your spirit. Quiet, yet dignified. Unassuming, yet proud. Hidden under umbrellas. Steady as raindrops. Thank you, there's more. <laughs> uh, Sid wanted me to, to read this poem. In fact, um, I wrote only one book of poetry, and um, I didn't make any money off it. I don't know if I even got any royalties. However, this one poem um, made me the most money. Uh, it was used by a lot of uh, educational books throughout uh, the world. They uh, decided this was a poem they wanted to use for teaching. And the poem came out of something that was quite interesting for me because I was sitting in Chinatown just back in the 70s and I, I was hearing, overhearing these three Chinese elders um, um, having a competition. And the competition was who suffered the most. And so, you know, it was going in that kind of direction. So you think that was bad, I'll tell you how this was and so on. And out of there came this one piece, and I think I should write more about it later on, but uh, I came out with one piece, and it's called Equal Opportunity. In early Canada, when railways were highways, each stop brought new opportunities. There was a rule. The Chinese could only ride the last two cars of the train. That is, until a train derailed, killing all those in front. The Chinese erected an altar and thanked Buddha. A new rule was made. The Chinese would now ride the front two carts of the China. 
<laughs> that is, until another accident came to everybody in the back. <laughs> the Chinese erected an altar in St. Buddha. After much debate, common sense prevailed. The Chinese are now allowed to sit anywhere on any table. <laughs> Uh, the train was in my blood for a long time because I lived in a small town in Merritt. And Merritt was um, a, a place where uh, you rely on the train. So there's a train station. If you want to come down to Vancouver or go up to Kamloops, you take the train. And one day I was told that the train was going to stop running and you have to go by bus from then on. And that notion to me also came with this idea that we've been always been told that for every mile that uh, the railroad was built from here to uh, the Rockies, one Chinese person died. So with that notion, I came up with this called Journey to Merit. This is the last train ever next week. I must leave by Greyhound. Not that I care. The CPR is not my father. Tracks clicked. As I watched the disappearing moon flashing, as singles do, before a change of rail, the cool breeze whips by. And every mile, I see Chinese workers, pitching girders, sometimes solitaire, sometimes blood splattered, sweating and singing, while the moon shines a spotlight on them. I had a, a cousin who was fairly bright and bushy tail. I mean, I worked in a cafe for a long time. Peeling 50 pounds of potato a day was not a lot of fun. But he seemed to have loved it. And he had a lot of ambition. And this, these are some of the notions that he had when we first got together. But what, what intended for this was a day where he actually brought me to show me off his new house. And it's, this is what I call an inspection of a house paid in full. I could not hide my curiosity at your pride in paying cash in full. Perhaps it's because you arrived in Canada, young and penniless. While working at our restaurant, you came up with the strangest notions that someday, when you own your own place, you can get away with substituting ink for coffee. Chief, profitable, Imitation, those wild, hopeful impossibilities made yours a rocky one-man road up the Golden Mountain. Yet you made it. And today, looking me square in the eye, you tell me you have arrived, your family at your side. My last words are, beware the tax man. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He actually got uh, audited. <laughs> um, also, one of Sid's great requests, this one's called Jimmy the Waiter. I think it's <coughs> self explanatory. I caught him picking his nose and flicking the snot into the cream of mushroom soup. <laughs> now that's for calling me a chink. I know he went her to fly, but would think nothing of serving it up with crackers. <laughs> You know, in the 70s, when so much immigration was coming, I encountered quite a few people that wanted so hard to assimilate that they actually forbid the children to speak any Chinese in home, at home. You know, there was such a need to assimilate. And out of there was a lot of people that were trying to teach people ESL for a second, you know, as a second language. And out of there, I came up with this piece I call How Feel I Do. Your eyes plead approval on each other word, and even my warmest smile cannot dispel the shamed muscles in your face. Let me be honest with you. <coughs> to tell the truth, I feel very much at home in your embarrassment. Don't be afraid. But you, I too, were mired in another language, and I gladly surrendered for English. You too? In time, will lose your mother's tongue and speak as least as soon as me. Now tell me, how do you feel? Uh, 
Um, actually, I went back to Hong Kong and you know got acculturated and learned my Cantonese. However, when I came back, um, because I was taught in Hong Kong, I was speaking Hong Kongese or you know city Cantonese. And here it was still very much short of dialect, and people actually ignored me. So for about 10 years, I stopped speaking. Or like, you know, every time I got a newspaper, I'd read it and I kept up with it, but I found that I couldn't speak. So I decided to go down to the, y, uh, the YWC, you know, we call it Pender Y in Chinatown, it was like a social agency. And I decided to uh, help these old people fill up forms. And in, in exchange, we, you know, I get to practice my Cantonese. You know. And um, so, I mean, it was a process. You know, like, you, 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 you have a process where you, you speak a bit of English, or you keep replacing words that you don't know in English and Chinese and so on until. You know. But eventually, I got through it. But one of the side effects of this was that there was all these <coughs> old people that had nobody to talk to. And all of a sudden, it was me. So they start filling out all their stories, all the pain and all this, all the stuff, and I had to take it. I mean, it also helped me because it taught me that I wasn't alone. You know, I wasn't the only one that was suffering and having problems with identity. Boy, these people had a hard time. Anyways, this is a piece that came out of the called Listen, Listen. I am captured, a willing victim. As the old man speaks, time stands very, very still. I hear the pop pop of his heartbeat trapped between words, uttered in panic, hurrying, afraid the thin thread between us would slacken and break loose forever. It's all right. I will listen. I will listen to all. But his reminiscence, the 16 hour day, had no time for time. I also had to help people send letters back to um, Hong Kong and the village. And this woman is one of the examples. She gave me three letters. Her daughter's son wanted to marry Senna Bowsen. Her sister's nephew has a firstborn, Senna 300. Her stepson in Hong Kong gambled his wages. Anything will do. Ann Ling had a pension and no more savings. She asked me to help her divide $10 and send each an equal share. 